about the recent homeowner's insurance inquiry. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You will see that there is an example which has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello? Yes, I'd like to speak with Janet Evans, please. Speaking. Hi, Miss Evans. This is Jim Rodriguez calling from Farley Mutual about your recent homeowner's insurance inquiry. The man says that he'd like to speak with Janet Evans. So, Janet Evans has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello? Yes, I'd like to speak with Janet Evans, please. Speaking. Hi, Miss Evans. This is Jim Rodriguez calling from Farley Mutual about your recent homeowner's insurance inquiry. Yes, hi. Thanks for returning my call. My pleasure. I understand you are potentially interested in insurance for a bungalow located a bit out of town. Could you give me the address? Sure. It's 49 Greenway Court. Greenway is one word. Thank you. All right. And would you prefer to be contacted via email or phone? Either one is fine. Maybe try emailing me first, and as an alternative, I can give you my phone number. Great. And what is your email address? pk2 at cat.com <clears throat> Did you say cat as in the animal? Yes, it is the acronym for the construction company I work for. I'm sure you've seen them around. Yes, I have. And could you give me your primary phone number and the best time to reach you? Sure. The number is 020 Four two five one nine double four three. I am generally unable to answer my phone at work, but any time after five thirty p.m. is fine. I will make a note of that here. Now I'm going to ask you a little bit about property itself, so we can make an accurate estimate of the cost of insuring your home. Could you tell me the size of your house? Mm, well, I don't have the exact measurements, but I'm pretty sure it's right around eighty square meters. Should I measure it and call you back later? No, that's completely all right. I'll write 80 square meters for now to get the estimate, and then an agent will come get the exact measurements later on if you decide to purchase our insurance. OK, great. And what material is your house made of? For example, wood, brick, stucco? It's mainly brick. Great. That will give you a lower rate than most of the materials, since it is so strong. Wonderful. And do you have any sort of home security, Miss Evans? Mm, we don't have a fence or anything yet, but we have an alarm system that we use regularly. Good. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Now I'll go through a number of things we offer coverage for, and I'd like you to tell me which items you want your policy to cover. OK. We'll start with the building itself first. Would you like us to cover incidental damage to the structure to your house? Absolutely. Splendid. And the contents inside your house. We usually cover all items with an appraised value of about £200. Would you like us to cover theft and damage beyond natural wear and tear? I will let you know that the second option here will come with a considerable increase in your rates. I think I'd just like the contents of the house to be covered against theft then. All right, and would you like any other insurance? Fire, flood, etc.? Yes, I definitely want flood coverage. 
It rains a lot here, and the drainage system in the area is not the greatest. Okay, I am calculating your quotation now.、Uh, it will just take a second. It looks like your annual insurance rate will be one hundred and forty-eight pounds thirty. Thanks. That seems somewhat reasonable. I would like to take some time to think about it. How long does it take to begin receiving coverage after signing up? It depends on the time of year. It can take anywhere from two to six weeks. I would say if you sign up by July the first, you could start your coverage by August the first. I see. Okay. Thanks for your help. Should I call you back at this number when I have made my decision? Yes, please, and so that we can look up your account faster. I'll give you a reference number that you should provide when calling. Ready? Yep. It's T R two seven eight Q. Got it. Thanks. Thank you, and have a nice day. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two on page four of your listening test booklet. Section two. The Overseas Students Club is organising a tour of the city to help new students to find their way around. You will hear the tour guide giving them a talk about what will happen the next day, and some instructions as to what to do. First. You will have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully to the first part of the talk. And answer questions eleven to fifteen. Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our city. I hope that you will have an interesting and valuable experience with us. As you know, we are going on a tour tomorrow to show you some of the sites and the places of interest. So I would like to give you some instructions and some information to prepare you for tomorrow. It is important that we all meet at the same place at the same time. You should all be able to get into the centre of the city by train or bus from your homestay. We want to start our tour at 10 a.m., so you'll have to make sure that you leave home around 9:15 in time to arrive for us to start the tour at 10. If you are late, we will not be able to wait more than a few minutes, so I suggest that you take your mobile phone and have my number just in case. My number is 0482557369. I will just repeat that so you can get it: 0482557369. You can see Ms. Parker after the talk if you do not have her number, and she will be happy to provide it. It's good to have both our numbers just in case. Oh, and another thing: it is better to buy a one-way ticket because the tour will last for three hours, and a return ticket lasts only for two hours. Before the final part of the talk, you now have twenty seconds to look at questions sixteen to twenty. Now answer questions sixteen to twenty. Now we are meeting at the town hall. You should be able to make your way there from the bus or train stations, which are both in Flinders Street. It is only a short walk from both stations. If you are coming to the city by train, the town hall is straight ahead of you when you exit the station. Just walk up Collins Street, and you will see it on the left after the traffic lights. If you come in by bus, you will need to turn right at the exit, then take the first street left, which is Collins Street. You will see the town hall on your maps. So if you have your maps with you, it's a good idea to mark the route now. Now, there will probably be quite a few people around in the city when you arrive, so it is important that we can find each other. Please don't go inside the building. 
We should all meet outside on the steps of the town hall to make sure we don't miss anyone. From there, we will be visiting a few places of interest. We will make our way to the library, which is in the same street. It will take us about 10 minutes on foot. It is a good library for students, so we'll be giving you about 20 minutes to have a look around at the facilities. That probably won't be enough time for all of you to join the library, so you'll have to come back at another time to do that. It might be a good idea to pick up a membership form before you leave. From the library, we will turn right into William Street, where you'll see a cinema on the left. This is popular with the students, and it shows some interesting art house movies. On the way, you might want to check out what is showing there at the moment. Diagonally opposite the cinema is the art gallery. There will be time, about 15 minutes, for a quick look at some of the exhibits. You will probably want to return by yourself for a longer visit another time. From there, we will walk up to the main street, which is Wellington Street, on your maps. It's around the next corner from the art gallery, and will show you some cheap but excellent restaurants, as well as cafes and bars, which I'm sure you will find useful in your free time. They are frequented by many of the students here, so I recommend that you come back later to sample the food and atmosphere. It is a good way to meet some of the local students as well. Well, I said that it would take about three hours. This is because we will be stopping at the park for a picnic lunch. The park is a 15-minute walk along the main street from the restaurant area. We will be supplying the lunch for everyone, so you won't need to bring anything. However, you will need to bring or buy your own drinks. If anyone has any special dietary requirements, please see me or Ms. Parker after this talk. Oh, and please make sure that you wear some comfortable clothes. Sensible walking shoes are advisable, as you will be doing quite a lot of walking. It is also a good idea to bring some sunscreen and a hat, as the sun can be quite strong at this time of the year. Finally, although the tour is free, you might want to bring some extra money with you for drinks or souvenirs. Well, I hope you all enjoy the tour and get to know each other. I'm sure we will have a great day. Now, anyone who needs to see me? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Test 2. Listening. Section 3. You will hear somebody talking to a group of students about a university language centre. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Hi, I'm Katie Shaw and I work at the University Language Centre. Your tutor tells me you might be interested in using the centre. So I'm here at the college to explain a bit about it, and of course to answer your questions. Where exactly is the centre? Is it near the college? It's actually on King's Road, just round the corner from here, in fact. Oh, I know it, yes. I wondered what that building was. Yes. What's there? Well, the library has about 4,000 books, pamphlets and transcripts to go with some of the 12,500 items on audio or video cassettes. These are at a wide range of levels of difficulty, covering language learning material in over 100 languages. There are also reference books without tapes, including dictionaries, grammars, grammar workbooks, vocabulary workbooks and model letters, as well as texts on academic writing and effective study habits, etc. Audio cassette workrooms are on the first floor, by the way. Do they get any foreign language press there, too? Yes. The library subscribes to a number of European daily and weekly newspapers, including Le Monde from France, L'Espresso from Italy, and the weekly international edition of the Spanish paper El País. What about learning with computers? Can you do that there? Call, or computer-aided language learning, is available on the first floor. Um, how many PCs are there? Counting both Macintosh and PC platforms, there are nine at present. There are materials in over 15 different languages, and new material and language categories are being added as library funds permit. 
The programs cover verb drills, uh, grammar exercises, activities to accompany multimedia textbooks, pronunciation, translation, and some multimedia applications. The same hardware permits access to the internet with its many language learning and discussion sites. What about TV? That's a good way of learning a language too. Yes, definitely. We agree. So on the second floor of the centre, there are televisions to view live satellite television broadcasts in seven languages. Ah,、oh, which ones are they? Currently, we've got Arabic, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, and Russian. Turkish broadcasting can be viewed live on request. The centre records the news in French, German, Arabic, Italian, Japanese, Spanish, and Russian, and English too. Test two, listening, section three. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Sounds great. How do we sign up? To avoid paying a fee, you need to go to the centre with a valid university ID card or a letter from your college or departmental administrator on headed paper indicating your status, length of stay, and language requirements. Are there any forms to fill in? I'm afraid so.、Mm. You do that at the ground floor reception desk. Your registration is for one academic year only and needs to be renewed annually. You should tell the librarian who you are on your first visit, and you will need to take part in an induction to the library service, including the proper operation of the centre's computers, televisions, videos, and so on. Can she help us choose the right materials too? Yes, the librarian can give advice and assistance in locating material. Making best use of the texts and tapes, and so on. Let her know which language you want to study and what, if any, knowledge of it you already have. Also, say what reasons you have for learning the language. Your answers will help the librarian help you make the best choice of books and tapes for your needs. She can also offer you advice on how much time is needed to make progress in the language, and can offer suggestions on how to improve your language learning techniques. Can she copy tapes for us to take home, or can we borrow them? The library is a resource centre and reference library only. You can do as much self-study listening and reading work there as you want, but it's not possible to take home materials. That's to say, books or cassettes. And copyright law doesn't permit the library or its staff to make copies of cassettes for use by students outside the centre. All material must be used on the premises. I'm afraid. This ensures the materials are always available for students working on their own, and not out on loan for long periods, which could harm users' progress. So, if we can't take books home, is it okay to photocopy them? The library staff will handle any photocopying, though international copyright law prohibits users from copying more than five percent of any one title in the academic year. You place a photocopy order with the librarian or an assistant. And orders will be processed between one and two o'clock, or after five thirty. How much does it cost? Ten pence per page. Payment is by photocopy card, which you can buy from the information desk on the ground floor. That is the end of section three. Now turn to section four. Section four. 
You will hear part of a talk about what happened at the Fukushima power plant after the March 2011 earthquake. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 36. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. To really understand what went on at Fukushima after the tragedy which was the March the 11th tsunami, I'm going to have to give you a brief introduction to nuclear power and an insight into how a nuclear power plant like Fukushima functions. Look at the diagram here on the screen. To the left there is a rather massive building. This is known as the containment building and it is safety wise the most fundamental aspect of a nuclear power plant. Containment buildings are typically constructed of steel or reinforced concrete. The Fukushima one was made of a mixture of both. Notice the concrete domed roof which was so prominent in the aerial photographs which were taken after the tsunami hit. The containment building is of course always completely airtight. to prevent leakage of radioactive material in the event of a malfunction or failure of plant systems it should also be natural disaster proof and fukushima's was given the regularity with which they occur in japan able to withstand huge magnitude earthquakes it also withstood the giant tsunami which struck the containment building itself therefore did its job but more on this later The containment building houses the reactor core, which is where all the nuclear reactions take place. You will also notice the four cooling rods. These rods can be raised and lowered as required to control reaction speed and soak up neutrons. Now, if you look to the right-hand side of the containment building, you'll notice the coolant system, which basically regulates the temperature of the core and prevents it from overheating. You have hot water from the coolant system flowing into the heat exchanger and cold water flowing back into the containment building. This hot water is then transferred through the feed pumps into the turbine hall, where it is harnessed to drive the turbines and generate electricity. But before the energy can be distributed into the national grid, it must be sent through a new conductor. And this is the function of the missing piece of the puzzle, the transformer. The transformer allows electricity to be conducted from the turbines into the national grid and that ladies and gentlemen is how nuclear powered electricity is generated more or less Before you hear the rest of the talk you have some time to look at questions 37 to 40 Now listen carefully and answer questions 37 to 40. So, what went wrong at Fukushima? Well, let's begin at the beginning. When the earthquake struck, the reactors automatically shut down. Of course, there were six reactors at Fukushima, so think of it as six plants like the one in the diagram running independently of one another. In actual fact, Only three of the reactors needed to be shut down, as reactors four to six were being inspected, so had already ceased to be operational. When the reactor shut down, no more electricity was being produced, so a new source of power was needed to run the cooling systems and prevent the reactor core from overheating. This is where the plant's on-site diesel generators came in. They were immediately powered on, and the reactor core's temperatures were being regulated again. So far, so good. But 50 minutes after the earthquake, the tsunami hit, breaching the plant's 5.7 meter defensive seawall. 
the tsunami flooded the basements of the six turbine halls and disabled the diesel generators. And this is where the problem began. You see, the containment buildings actually did their job, and reactors one to six were not compromised by the earthquake or the subsequent tsunami. However, site engineers and safety personnel had failed to take into account the possibility of the sea wall being compromised. Once this happened and the turbine halls flooded, the diesel generators were useless. It was going to be a race to get the coolant systems up and running again in time to stop meltdown or fallout from occurring. With the generators down, power was now being supplied by batteries with a life of no more than eight hours each. The last resort the plant had in an emergency of this nature. Furthermore, inside reactor one, even some of the batteries had failed. The reactor core was not being cooled sufficiently. And both temperature and pressure inside the containment building were rising. Eventually, a day after the tsunami, there was an explosion in the reactor building, and the roof collapsed. Engineers made a desperate attempt to cool the reactor core by pumping salt water into it, but the damage had already been done, and the reactor had begun leaking. It was confirmed later that same day that meltdown had occurred. That is the end of section four. You now have. Half a minute to check your answers.